Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Data Diversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will be joined, uh, today Donna will be talking about data governance and data architecture alignment and synergies. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A panel, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategy. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. And to open the chat and the Q&A panels, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and recording of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. In fact, she'll be at our DGIQ conference in June. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Always a pleasure to do these webinars and see some familiar faces or names on the chat. So thanks for everyone who has been joining pretty regularly over the years. So uh, for those of you who might be new uh, to this series or new to data diversity, welcome. Um, one of the first questions we always get is, will we get the slides and will this be recorded? And yes to both. Um, the other good news, little bonus, is that all of the previous webinars, and we've been doing this series for a few few years now, um, are, are all sort of um, kept in the digital library at Dataversity. So if you missed any of the previous ones on data strategy or master data management, uh, they all are recorded. And, and Shannon and team always send out a link after this with all the links to this and the upcoming events as well. Um, so, um, the, today's topic is going to be on uh, data governance and data architecture and alignment and, and synergies and sort of what does that mean. Um, so what we'll cover today is, is that difference between governance um, and architecture and, and where are they the same uh, and where are they the difference and, and how do they fit together. So cut to the chase, they are separate, se separate uh, areas that relate together. So. You can just end the webinar now. No, I hope there's a little more nuance to that. Um, and we'll sort of get into the details of, you know, wh wh what those differences are, what the overlap is, and, and how you can really make the best of both worlds um, in your data architecture and your data-driven initiatives. So without further ado, um, another thing that the university does, which has been really uh, popular over the years, is do, the, do a number of surveys. And I've done a few with them. One is that we've been doing is trends in data management uh, and kind of seeing some, some common trends. Um, one common one is always data governance and some things that kind of ebb and flow over the years. Uh, so I found these statistics fairly interesting um, that when we look at data governance, over 75% or 76% have a, a <clears throat> data governance initiative already in place or are planning one in the near future or are kind of in the nascent early stages. I, I That feels about right to me. I mean, we, we see a higher percentage in our practice. Um, you know, I kind of do this as a day job. And, um, but we, I know we have a select audience kind of by definition of who we work with. Um, but I do see that trend increasing, which is, is really, really positive. The second one I like, and it's not a surprise to me because um, we do this a lot, but I think maybe is not the, the stereotypical uh, vision of data architecture. When you think of data architecture and people say, yes, that's a great way for us to collaborate with different team members, that might be a surprise. And there's different areas of, of data architecture. Um, <clears throat> if anyone's heard me speak before or, or know me, you know I'm a huge fan of data models, especially that business centric data model. And we've had really great, which is a part of data architecture, and we've had really, really great um, collaboration with the business through something like a conceptual or even logical data model. And some of the comments are like, we never, we, we knew we had these problems, we could never express it in a way that made sense to IT and, and vice versa with kind of the data and you know, the more technical data side. And how do we really translate these business rules? And we've had some really good 
conversations um, sort of around uh, data models. The, the other one we do a lot is just that high level system architecture. You know, often, you know, what's we, we just did a really uh, successful data strategy and what sort of a, a couple months ago um, and what really hit home with the, with the senior managers was our architecture diagram with all those spaghetti lines, right? <laughs> that stuff that, you know, we've all seen, we've all seen the spaghetti diagrams, but sometimes it's just pointing out that one line between system A to system B that doesn't integrate or something. So, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, in data architecture, there's a lot of, we'll talk about that, a lot of nuance in different areas of data architecture, but often it's those, um, you know, high level or kind of enterprise level architecture diagrams, whether it's a data flow or it's a data model or it's a system architecture diagram, et cetera, et cetera, are often, you know, really nice tools to really get at the, you know, suss out the, as we say, the so what of the different problems you need to solve. Um, so <clears throat> we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a little more detail, but I thought these statistics were fairly interesting. Um, a lot of us are architects or, you know, data governance folks on this call, and we love our definitions. So um, would be remiss if I didn't point to the DEMA DMBOC. If you're not a member of DEMA or the Data Management Association, they have chapters around the globe. Super, super helpful. I've been a member uh, for years now. Um, and they have a data management body of knowledge or the DMBOC. If that's new to you, definitely get a copy. I am a contributor to that as well. Um, you know, we've got the PM box for product project management. We've now got, you know, I guess it's not new anymore. It's been around for, for years, but you know, that data management body of knowledge. And, and I know every single um, you know, implementation is different, but a lot of this has been done before. So it has some good foundation. So I'm gonna take their definitions, which I think are fairly solid. So what is data governance? Um, and what I like about their definition is they show a little bit of that nuance. The data governance is the exercise of authority, control, and shared decision-making over the management of your data assets. And I, I sort of like that in some of my presentations, I kind of almost call that, you know, the yin and yang of, of in some cases that's that the authority, the planning, the you, you can't do this, don't do this, and your different rules and policies. But the other aspect is that collaboration, right? That shared decision-making. I may be naive, some, the older I get, I feel like I may be, um, but I tend to find at most companies that we work with that people are adults and most people come to work wanting to do a good job. So very rarely, I think one in my entire long career, did someone ever say, you know, I'm going to work to try to hide data or not share data. People are trying to get their work done or, or they only see their piece of it. So generally when you have things like governance committees and you get those people in the room, people see the other side or they can at least, you know, agree to disagree and create those kind of shared decisions. So to me, that's a lot of that governance, getting that balance of control, also getting the, the different voices in the room, et cetera. When you look at data architecture, that's more on that, I would call the data management. Um, and that's, you know, I, I talked before on the previous slide about, you know, representing the organizational data at different levels of abstraction so you can understand it. So when you get those people in the room, what do you talk about, right? How do we, how do we show in a way, um, you know, I always say, I, a, I like to say that I'm a visual thinker, but I think we all are, right? You see a picture of something, you, you're trying to find, you know, go somewhere in the road, you look at a map, a map is just a visual representation of the roads. It'd be really hard to, to go somewhere without having something like that. So similar to that to me, that's the data architecture. And there's a lot of different architect, uh, artifacts of a data architecture. Um, there's some there listed, there's data requirements, you know, data integration, there's a lot of data models, data flow diagrams, et cetera. And so the, my, my definition there at the bottom is maybe overly simplistic. I'm sure there'll be some heavily chat, uh, heavily, um, you know, vibrant chat uh, saying that I may be too simplistic here. There's always a never a shy audience at Dataversity. Um, but I, I almost think that, you know, data architecture, you could probably say is that technical side of data governance. There's technical data governance, there's business data governance. And then there's some overlap um, and there's, a, there's you know, a, a progression there that we'll talk about and, and sometimes it's both together. But that might be the easiest way to think of it. You know, architecture is architecture and governance is governance, but, you know, there, there's a, some overlap there. Um, if, again, if you've joined us before, you, you've seen this framework. So this is um, our framework at Global Data Strategy that I often use here in these webinars because it really kind of uh, shows a lot of these pieces in a data management or a data strategy um, that people um, you could kind of fit together. So, you know, this is our framework for a data strategy. But whenever we do a data strategy, a huge component of a data strategy is data governance and collaboration and data architecture. So th there's some reuse here. So with governance and with architecture, it needs to start with business drivers. There's no reason to do anything in data unless it has a business impact. And I use business 
you know, uh, loosely, that's an organization. It could be a hospital, it could be a nonprofit, it could be a school. Um, but your organization, what are you trying to do? What, what benefit are you trying to get? And then how can data enable that? So that's kind of that top down that drives the governance. Again, huge difference. And, and again, we're, we're consultants. So that's what we try to really suss out in our first few days in an engagement. You know, what, what is the governance? Are you a hospital? And this is patient information. Very, very different than something like a social media company that maybe people are, you know, putting public information out and they wish to have that information out very different than the patient diagnosis, right? So, you know, what data needs to be governed is, is you know, very important. So then the architecture is kind of that bottom up. Do we have data in databases? Are we using IoT and big data and unstructured data? Do we have data in documents? Super, super important, uh, you know, a snarky comment I always like to make when, when we're doing a, a data strategy or data governance or data architecture and folks say, well, we don't look at documents. I mean, that's knowledge management, that's document management, right? And I say, well, you know, if, if you get your credit card information stolen and someone says, oh, that's okay, that wasn't a PDF, it wasn't in a database, do you care? <laughs> There's still data there, that's still your credit card number, it might be in a document. So you really need to look holistically when you're looking at an architecture and governance, right? Because you need to govern it all. And then loosely architecture, you'll see that there's a box in the in kind of middle right there talking about data architecture, data model modeling. But I would say in a way architecture kind of encompasses a lot of this. You're doing an architecture for master data management or for data warehousing. And I would also argue a piece of data architecture is metadata management or data integration. So again, they all fit together, but each one of these can and actually is generally a webinar <laughs> that you could spend a whole hour or more talking about master data or data quality, right? And then I see data governance, again, is that glue between what does the business want to do and what do we need to do technically? And there's people in this process and there's policies and there's a whole culture, a data-driven culture around you know, information sharing or lack of sharing and et cetera. Um, and that really drives your architecture. So again, they all fit together, um, but, but there is definitely some overlap that I thought was kind of worth talking through. Um, uh, back to the surveys, because we are data-driven people and we love our data. So, so this was, uh, I guess, from the a more recent uh, 2021 survey. I think the new one is going to be coming out shortly. We're kind of compiling that this year. But I found this interesting because when we talked to companies, I think there was uh, Shannon probably has a statistic, but it's several hundred across the globe. So this isn't just North America, it's, it's Europe, it's Asia, it's Latin America. Um, that, but basically said what uh, across all industries too, um, what, what are your priorities in place? And we compared that from what, what is in place you know, in, in 2021 or kind of currently in place and what are you planning to do moving forward? So I found this interesting. When you look at the top priorities for 2021, all about business intelligence, data warehousing, Probably not a surprise. When most people say they want to be a data-driven company, mostly it's analy analytics or reporting. That's kind of the front face of data. Is data more than that? Of course. It's your operational data. It's your you know, real-time runtime data. But I think you know when people talk data-driven and so much of that tends to be beyond reporting. So that's fine. I was pleased to see that data security was sort of top of mind up there. Um, but you'll see data governance and data architecture where good news is in the top 10, actually in the top five, it isn't top of mind. Um, top of mind is I want my report. So my color commentary on that is when you look then at 2022 and 2023, what bubbles up to the top, you know, data governance is number one. My color commentary is, well, maybe we started looking at those reports that were top of mind and they weren't quite right, or I didn't trust them, or we had a disagreement on how you calculated a metric or a KPI. Um, that's often where data governance starts. We know we can't agree on the numbers and we're, we're reporting the numbers to the street. We're reporting numbers internally. Uh, we need to agree. So not a surprise to me that data governance is, top of mind for 2022, 2023. Sometimes um, I, I tend to be a, you know, when there's, what do they call it, the offense or defense or carrot and stick tend to be the, you know, offense, carrot, positive, glass half full. Um, and what we're seeing is a lot of governance for data-driven business decision-making, you know, but the, the CEO says, you know, I need to be data-driven and we want to be a data company. We want to, you know, you need to have governance for that. The other aspect or kind of the defense or glass, I don't want to say class of empty, but, you know, kind of the, 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 you know, you must do it type of aspect is, is regulation, right? If you're financial services or your education or your healthcare, you really can't get away with not doing governance. Or if you're reporting your finances to the street, you need to have data governance. Right. So not a huge surprise. I think that the, the close second of data strategy sort of goes to that previous point of companies know they need to be data driven and you need to figure out a way to do that. I was a little disappointed that my very favorite data architecture kind of ended up at, at the bottom. It's still, again, in the top 10 there. Um, 
But um, I guess the positive could be, if you look at the numbers in 2021, um, more people were already doing data architecture, right? So, you know, maybe there's a good foundation there, she says naively. <laughs> you know, I, that said, I, you know, I have, as, as Shannon pointed out, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, you know, I would say that the overall general maturity level of a lot of companies we go into are good, you know, despite the, the commonly vaunted demise of data models, I, I'm not seeing that. I think a lot of companies just, it's just a standard best practice. So maybe it's not, you know, on the upper edge of the Gartner hype cycle anymore. It's just a business as usual thing. So I'm trying to stay positive that data architecture is at the bottom because it is probably a business as usual activity that people don't necessarily have as their you know top uh, driver for 2022 i hope governance gets the word you know up there um you know probably like every company has a finance department you don't necessarily say that's going to be a new trend or initiative to have a finance department um you just have one <laughs> so i think sometimes being bau or business as usual um is good so maybe data governance and data architecture will never be a trend anymore and it won't be a future priority it'll just be a future activity that of course we will do it that's my color commentary there as well so again numbers can always as we know we're data driven and there's data literacy and that's my my interpretation of these numbers you you may have your own um but i did think that this was kind of a helpful thing to look at as we have a whole webinar here on data governance and data architecture and how they fit together um <laughs> Speaking of governance, and I may be a little heavier on the governance side in this webinar because the whole series is on data architecture, and a lot of these things on data architecture are maybe covered in more depth in another webinar. So if I don't cover data models to your liking or I don't talk about metadata enough, be assured that there's probably a webinar either in the future or in the past that you can delve down deeper. And I hope you are asking for more because those things are near and dear to my heart. Um, but this is a, a framework that, again, we use in our practice for our uh, data governance. And when you look at data governance, you know, everything has its own framework, right? Each one of these probably has its own framework within it. But, you know, key to any successful governance or, or architecture is that vision and strategy. That that relates to that, um, you know, in, in the previous um, framework that, you know, we need to align our business strategy with our data strategy. If you don't have that common vision, why bother? Stop, get a vision, understand why you're doing it before you do anything. And then I would say kind of the, the bottom of that sandwich or the foundation of the house um, is that culture and communication. Once, again, call me naive, but I generally have a positive feeling about human beings that, you know, generally when people need to know why they do, do something or they see that it's tied to the mission of their organization or, or their own job, they're a little, you know, more, more aligned to do it. So again, we've had a lot through things like data architecture, a lot of positive um, results, and I'll share a case study at the end of, you know, people are busy, and they're, they're doing a data entry screen, and ask for something like, I don't know, NAIC code, I don't know what that even means, I just have to sell this product, and that's how I get my commission, I'm moving on, but once you have something like data governance, we show a business process workflow, or we show a data flow, and we show where that code is used for another department to do analytics, or to do invoicing, or, or, or something, people say, oh, okay, well, if you're using that, I'll spend the extra time to put it in, right? So that kind of builds that communication and the culture. Of, now that I know why and that we're a team and, and the, the data I'm using is used downstream, a little more likely to, to spend the extra time to do that. But we're all human and we're all, you know, we're all data driven in our brains to some extent. If I have a lot of work to do and one of these tasks, I have no idea why I'm even doing it. <laughs> I'm not going to prioritize that one. But once I know that my piece in the wheel or cog or with a bad analogy, piece of the puzzle is, is, is important, then you'll be more likely to do it. So back to you know, what is data governance? What is data architecture? What is data management? What is data? Gosh, we could spend, we probably would, a whole day discussing those nuances. So I, I kind of step back and I don't care what you call it as long as you do it. <laughs> Probably get some arguments on that one. So, but when you think of the different pillars of data governance in general, there is that organization and people aspect. Do you have a data governance committee? Do you have data stewardship and data owners? Do you have a lead of data governance that's really going to help to drive that? A huge part of governance is that people, and that's going to drive your culture, et cetera, et cetera. There's also processes and, and workflows, and I'll delve a little more into this as well. Part of that is the processes, this is very meta, but the processes for data governance. How do I log an issue around data when there's a problem? How do I require a data model as part of my agile sprint cycle, right? These, these are certain data centric processes. There's also business processes that generate data. So how do I, how do I onboard a vendor and do I get the right data from the get-go or onboard a customer or an employee? That's all data and that's data driven. So it's a bit of both to really get 
governance working correctly? Do the business processes that create or edit or update or delete data, good old crud, um, are, are those in, in sync? And do we have the right processes if they're not in sync or as we develop things within the data management space or data architecture space to support data? And then there's data management measures, which is I see really where data architecture fits. Um, do we have data models? Do we have data flow diagrams? Do we have data standards? Do we have a project life cycle for data development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? That pillar to me is where I see data architecture fitting. And then tools and platforms that I put at the, at the, the end there, if I could have put it a little tiny thing in the corner. Um, love tools, I'm a big nerd, was actually on the vendor side, you know, developing several of the tools in the market today for many years. So not that I don't like tools, but maybe that jaded me. <laughs> um, it shouldn't be tool first, right? Tools should fit the, the, the project at hand. So not that I'm not a fan of tools. Please don't ask me in this webinar which one to pick. I will not answer. We're vendor neutral here. but. Um, I'll talk about that at the end of make sure tools are as a result of your data architecture goals and your data governance goals and don't start with a tool and try to make it fit right so moving ahead um this i will not read <laughs> every every row or be here all day um but often when we show something like this like the, we call it our house our data governance house um what, what goes in each one? What do you mean by org and people? What do you mean by processes and workflows? So these are just some kind of questions to help delve in. And again, each one of these cells could be probably a whole webinar, right? But, you know, am I aligned on my business strategy? Is there a clear understanding of the goals and why we need governance? Organization and people both, um, many things. Who are the key stakeholders? Who are the consumers? Who's the users? Who are the stewards? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you can kind of read through each of these um, to really get an understanding of some of those ideas um, in each of the pillars. So uh, kind of, I'll go through some of those pillars and just um, kind of a, a little, I guess I call it a visual mnemonic there. Um, here is that organization and people, the kind of, oops, sorry, the, the people that you saw in the house here, right? We'll kind of go through, you'll see the people, you'll see the process, you'll see the data management, and then you'll see the tools. Again, all at a super high level, but just to kind of set the stage. So when we look at the organization and people, and this is something that, again, if you're not familiar with the data manager, DEMA DMBOK or the data management body of knowledge, they, they've got some good best practices. I would say that the kind of the line up top, but there's no one size fits all. You may not have these roles. You may call these roles a different thing. You may have a subset of these roles, et cetera, et cetera. These are sort of standard generally used best practices. Again, I'm not, <clears throat> don't say that Donna Burbank said we need to have technical data storage. You may, but that might not fit with what you're doing as an organization. So with that caveat, generally back to that, everything should be vision led. There's generally some sort of executive sponsor. And I feel strongly that this executive sponsor should be from the business, not from IT. Uh, I was having a bad day the other day. <laughs> a project was not going well. And I said, okay, what, there's almost no offense to what I'm going to say. What, what have been the themes of when we've had a data governance it, you know, initiative that hasn't gone as well as we would have liked to is generally when it's IT led. Not that IT is not great, not that the technical themes are great. I consider myself a technical person, but people expect the data team to say you need to have good data, right? Your executive champion should come from the business, your chief marketing officer, your chief financial officer, your CEO, you know, your chief medical officer, whatever that is, not your chief CIO or even your CDO, your chief data officer, right? You need to make sure this is driven by the business and it should be that, business. you know, we need this data to be better so we can drive our business, right? Then generally there's some sort of business data owner or data owner, I mean, it could be redundant. Um, generally your data owners and data stewards are from the business, but we kind of just say that to stress that point. And to me, um, your data owner is going to be more at your director, manager, VP level, depending on your company, they're really going to kind of set that high level business rules and, and strategy um, and maybe some KPI thresholds and things like that. Your data steward is a little more into the day to day, into the weeds. They're probably going to understand some of those key business rules, et cetera, et cetera, often report up to a data owner. Um, and then your technical data steward uh, one of my many rants that I will hold back from today is, you know, you don't, don't do your data management or your data governance by saying, well, that's the Salesforce data or the, there I used a vendor, but I think it's common enough, right? Uh, or the PeopleSoft vendor or the, you know, clinical data management um, vet. You know, we tend to almost use the tools as a 
you know, as explaining the type of data or a business process, it shouldn't. Your business process should live outside any software and your data should be independent of any software. That said, that software does drive things you need to have and a lot of your rules are embedded in that software. So generally having a technical data steward who is a PeopleSoft expert or, a, you know, your clinical data management expert, or whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, so you need them to kind of live together with your business data stewards. But key to this conversation, took my time getting there, apologize, are the two at the bottom. I would say your data governance lead and your enterprise data architect. So I would say where those business roles up top, like your data owner and your data steward and, and very much your data executive sponsor, those aren't like you, you have a day job and you should have a day job because that's your representation. I'm representing, again, patient advocacy or I'm representing student um, registration or sales onboarding, right? And, and I look at data for that area. Um, and that should be a part-time role. By definition, you have a day job and you're looking at the data as part of that day job. But when we look at data governance or data architecture, that is your day job, right? G generally for data governance to be successful, and I know there's companies of different sizes and different budgets, um, but having that data governance lead be a full-time role, often that, that, that data governance lead turns into your chief data officer, right? It's that champion of the whole data effort. That person should be technical enough to know what data lineage is and, and, and data architecture is, but that's, they're, they're more of a business role. And so where you fill that gap is with an enterprise data architect or a data architect um, that I, and if you've heard the phrase of purple people, right? That kind of, if you think of maybe red as technical and, and blue as business, a purple person can kind of see both. And I think both the data governance lead and an enterprise data architect or, or purple people, I should have made the purple, but I didn't. Uh, purple people that can kind of see both sides, um, but but it's probably the percentage. Whereas data governance lead is a high percent businessy that can talk just enough about data catalogs and data lineage and data models and data flow, um, but wouldn't hands-on do it. Similarly, the data architect should be able to speak to the business. You should be able to take a, a complex data architecture and present it in a way at a conceptual or logical level that the business can understand but they're primarily a technical role. And, th and that's why I will see them as like two heads of the same co coin or, you know, brother, sister or whatever, but they should be sort of joined at the hip and that to really make this whole thing successful, they can really augment each other. Um, so I see those as really why they're at the bottom there is that they are full-time roles and they are the foundation of that governance um, as it fits together going forward. So um, kind of to that point and why, you know, I, I started out with definitions because the more older I get in life and the more longer I, I do consulting or data management or anything, it's like, what do you mean by that? Could you define that term? You know, we've all, uh, I see a lot of folks in this call that, you know, probably doing this a long time and we can all get a chuckle about, you know, what do you mean by customer? What do you mean by vendor? How, do, well, how is a vendor different from a supplier, right? Some of these things that seem so obvious can have massive differences in you know, how we define our data. Um, and, and, and like to define that. So data governance is one of those, right? What do you mean by data governance? Some people think, oh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the, I don't know, Azure data type naming standards on our platform. They're right. That's a very technical part of data governance. Someone might say, oh, it's our data literacy campaign for our, our data steering committee. It's a very people-y side and they're right as well, right? And that's sometimes where you can either embrace that and say, yep, Yes, and <laughs> you're both parts of governance, or some people get people get in a head spin um, and kind of start arguing over it. Um, apologies again, I seem to be mean to IT today or technical. I didn't really mean the technical to be a devil and the business <laughs> to be the angel. It was just a picture. Um, I like creating databases too. Um, but but again, they're, they're, the, the point is that probably, again, it, there are very few people, um, they're the unicorns of the world that can be, you know, heads down in AWS and understanding everything Thinking about that platform and all the technical business roles and being a champion for change and, and you know working with the C level to understand business drivers and things. They're, they're kind of different personality types, and just time and bandwidth, right? Um, so generally there's kind of several people who work together uh, with those different pointy parts, I guess. If you know and I'm, I'm pointed to tech or I'm pointed to the people and that kind of thing. Okay, uh, so this is a little more detail. I kind of dusted off and changed this one from years ago. We were at IS so has to do a webinar on kind of the different roles in data management, what they mean. And oh gosh, there's a definition. What's a data engineer? What's a data? We, again, could be a whole, whole argument in the, in the webinar on that. But there are some general trends here that I'm just trying to show if we could, again, argue on exactly what we mean by these. But 
I, I kind of broke them out. There's data architect or technical roles, and then there's data governance or business roles. And, and what are the, some of the things they do together um, that can augment each other? So if we start at kind of that, the, the technical up top, you know, the, the, if you think, so it's, it's technical and business, and then kind of from the left is top down business vision. And then on the right is kind of bottom up technical architecture. If hopefully this is helpful and not totally confusing. Um, but if you think of, you know, who's setting the vision, the technical vision, that could be your CIO, right? What, what is our, our business and design of the whole thing we're doing? Are we, are we going to go digital transformation? Are we going to go cloud first? You know, what, what are we looking to do? And then as we go down into the business requirements, um, that might be your high level uh, business capability models, your design thinking, your, you know, what are we even trying to do at a high level? That's gonna be your data architect, business analyst, enterprise architecture, maybe data modeler. Um, again, a whole argument of data modeler versus data architect, which we'll <laughs> save for another day, right? But that's kind of your high level, you know, maybe your conceptual data model, right? As you go more into designing the data landscape and then down to your database and then down into your execution into your data source and your platform, you'll see that those, those roles get a little more technical from architect to engineer to you know, platform engineer. And you'll see that you know, there's a whole range of skills. It takes a, it takes a village to create a <laughs> successful data strategy and data implementation. And you can see some of the artifacts that it may be created. I would say almost all of these are governancey, right? So do I have a backup or recovery plan for my platform way over on the right? I hope so. To me, that's governance. That's technical data governance. Um, do I have, you know, back to the database level, database naming standards and, and you know, data type standards and, and, and data platform configuration standards? Those are technical data governance. When we go to the left and kind of the business and vision side, if you look at the bottom, that's to me where some of that data business led data governance comes in. So who might be at the vision of the CEO? Again, I feel very strongly and I'm kind of backed up in the industry there. I don't think I'm saying anything crazy that data governance should be business led, right? It should be your CEO, your chief marketing officer, your chief financial officer. And you'll see there that I put chief data officer in the business. That could be a webinar discussion, right? And why isn't that up with the CIO? Probably could be one of those purple roles in the middle. I like to put it in the business because a chief data officer should be data driven business. You know, why are we doing this? Not because we need better tech is because we need a better business driven by data, kind of a nuance there. And then as you go down to the business requirements or the vision, that those are gonna be your data owners, your business data owners. What do we wanna do with data? How do we high level design it? And that's, excuse me, probably where your data governance lead comes in. That's a little more hands-on. And again, if you're a smaller organization, maybe the data governance lead is also kind of wearing that chief data officer hat, setting the vision mission you know, of why we're doing this. Kind of, as I mentioned before, anyone on this call is that career and they're aspiring to a chief data officer. I often feel that the data governance lead is, is perfect for that trajectory. Because again, you understand tech, but you really have to be a champion for change um, there. And then as you kind of go further down the stack, the data governance lead really should have a, at least a high level vision over all of it. But your data stewards, they're probably going to be more into your more detailed data models and your glossaries and your, you know, a little more on the technical side, maybe more with the data modelers, um, understanding those detailed business roles. So hopefully that's helpful and not confusing, um, but it is sometimes where we get ourselves tied in the knot of what do we mean by governance? Yes, <laughs> there's a lot of things of governance. What I didn't add, actually had in here and took out as another layer is, is security. And you may say, why didn't I put it here? Um, only so much on a slide in a webinar, but there's security um, and privacy controls or even legal that has a uh, kind of a layer on this. So, so that's why data governance in terms of the people and getting the right people in the room part is so powerful. But that can also make it complex. So to me, it's a little, also a little bit of that division of duty that yes, the data architects are responsible for those business rules and how they're implemented on a platform or how we handle data lifecycle management. You know, maybe security is, is more, you know, uh, on PII and where the where the lineage of PII is across the organization and legal sets those rules for PII. So they all have touch points with governance, but they also have their own ownership in that technical ownership. And I, I guess to me, that's where that data governance and data architecture, those touch points. Data architects should be in the room and in a, in a, say we have a data uh, governance council. My, my advice or opinion is, it should be 80%, 90% business people, but you should have a data architect in the room. They're almost your, your technical advisor, right? So you're not going to go and A, they should understand the business and B, 
that could help guide down a path that you're, you're not creating something that's not going to be executable down the road. Similarly, you should probably have security in the room as well. Advisors, not drivers of the, of the decision, if that makes sense. So a uh, big slide, lots I rambled about, but hopefully that was sort of helpful there. Moving ahead, um, if you remember our little, now we're on process and workflow. Uh, and this is high level, but uh, it kind of hits on what I was talking about before, um, where there's several you know, <laughs> meta layers of process. So there's your data governance process. How do we you know, log a data governance issue? How do we define the definition of customer? Who decides, do we vote? Uh, do we battle it out with, <laughs> with you know, punching bags? Or you know, ooh, how, how do we handle this? Um, so how we handle data governance? Again, these are all overlapping. So how does that align with your data management processes? Pure data management, yeah, we're creating business rules and we're putting that in a data model or an application. How do you have that touch point for what the developers need or the architects need and how that has a touch point with your data governance um, and there should be one. And then again, as I mentioned, your regular old business processes. So often um, when we develop a business um, data governance council, you know, how do you, like, again, could be a whole webinar. How do you decide who's in that council? Is it by org? We have finance and we have account uh, and we have sales and, or is it by business process? We have source to pay, we have, you know, uh, product development, you know, onboarding or, or whatever. Um, that's often a, 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 something to think about, but often those process owners are a really good candidate for being in your data governance because they're the ones driving how the data is, you know, how do we onboard a vendor? What do we do when we get a new employee or we offboard an employee? Those are all the business processes that are driving your data implementation. Um, journey maps, and I kept that kind of generic. You, we often hear customer journey maps. My cynical side is that's kind of the hipster version of a process flow. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's a pro data business process from the customer's point of view in, in a way. Or, but we, the reason I left it generic is, you know, we do a lot of journey maps for, we, we've done student journey maps. You know, what is the, the journey of a student in a university or a, you know, even a preschool? Um, what's a patient journey map, right? What's an employee journey map, right? So a uh, good, good way to look at that um, flow charts is that the, you know, I don't know, discount version of a business process, right? <laughs> Workflow, whatever. Um, but, but again, understanding how data is entered that that really and managed that's the a key part of your data governance operations as well because that's your operational side so just don't don't want to forget that uh, when you're doing your data architecture and your data governance because they all all fit together okay that's all i'll say about that again could be a whole webinar um now the other part that makes this confusing and maybe this will help and, and maybe again we could argue is one of these go on the left or the right or does it really sit in the middle but in general uh, there's certain artifacts that would live or activities that live with the business side of the data governance. Um, here's where I did kind of the blue and the red and the purple, right? So if we think business C is blue, um, those are the things on the left. You know, your pure technical stuff is on the right and the things that need to be shared are sort of that purpley in the middle, right? So you could say pure business, you know, what is our data centric business goals? It should be by the business, right? IT might have a you know opinion, and 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 often you know some of the best ideas ideas come from the people who know the data or know the systems. But really, it should be owned by the business. And how, what are our priorities? What is what does good look like? What's our success criteria? Um, business glossary in terms of what are our business terms? What are these all acronyms that every company wants to have, right? Um, then if you go kind of to the to the right. What would be owned just by tech, your data architecture strategy, your roadmap, um, you know, again, should be informed by the business, but the business, and this happens, uh, the business shouldn't say, hey, we're moving to AWS, or we're going to use a, a lake versus a warehouse, or they should have the requirements, and then IT decides that, maybe that's controversial, but really, IT should own that, or, yeah, I'm using IT just to be more of the technical side, I know that doesn't always make sense with data. But you know, what tool we pick, I'll have a whole rant at that in the end of should be chosen by IT. You know, input from the business or requirements from the business, but that's an IT thing. Once we get to physical data model, physical data standing platform change management, definitely on kind of that red technical side. Where things are shared, uh, let me go back to the business glossary, right? So maybe that's a shared, um, but there's a certain aspect of a data dictionary, data catalog um, that where sometimes it's pure business terms and sometimes it gets into that. Now we're talking about a critical data element or a, um, you know, a metric that needs to be defined with the BI team. That's kind of that shared side. If you literally had a business glossary just of, you know, what does a your credit default swap mean or what does this acronym mean? 
the business could own that. But right once it starts to get more data centric or you want to put that in a big fancy tool, that's where it starts to be shared. So similarly, if we start up at the top, you know, there's data centric business rules, what goes in the data model, what goes in the application, conceptual logical data models. Um, I already talked about the data catalog and then things like data lifecycle and retention rules. Like maybe you could argue that should be owned by IT, but the rules themselves, how long do we keep um, patient information? Often that's, you know, defined by law or defined by the business. So that again, it might be implemented by IT. IT actually, you know, moves it to cold storage or sends it off in a box to, you know, Iron Mountain or, or something, but the business really defines that. The, the, you know, and I think IT was probably the first to say, yep, I don't want to be responsible for those rules you tell me, and then we, we get it done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's plenty more, I'm sure, in this, you know, many. Um, but the, the point is data governance is a team sport, or for the non-athletes, it's an orchestra, not a solo, or you know, whatever. It's, it's, you know, people who work together to get there. It's not um, a, a one-person thing. And that that's often hard when I guess that's both on architecture and governance. We're all human. We all want to make it in this world. Um, but sometimes I'll see a data governance lead that, you know, I want to run this and I'm going to, I'm going to make it my project. And that's great. But in order to make that successful, everyone else has to feel like it's their project, right? You get the most success when somebody else gets up at the executive meeting and says, yes, it is important. And you didn't, everyone expects you to say that, right? So that's that, you got to make it the orchestra, not the solo. And similarly with the architecture, right? There's plenty of really brilliant data architects, but if you built that up in your ivory tower and didn't really get the buy-in for the rest of the team, they're going to ignore you and build their own thing anyway, right? So again, that's that, that purple person that can not only set the vision, but get everyone to come along with you. I know often people say, when they say, you know, who's a good data governance lead? I say, well, it's that type of person that can tell everyone what to do and people still like you. <laughs> and those people exist um, that can kind of gently shepherd people along and, and kind of get people to change their ways. So hopefully that was helpful um, as well. So uh, back to the, the data management and measures, which is you know, really, I think, more of that data architecture part of it. Sorry, get a glass of water. I've been babbling away here. Um, to me, some of these artifacts are some of those things that are in that purple middle, right? There's a lot of architecture artifacts, but when we're trying to say, well, how do we get to that intersection of business and tech and architecture? I've had a huge success with a lot of these good old fashioned business data model, business process model, your high level data architecture diagram. What are your, your core business rules? What's your glossary? What are your policies? A data quality dashboard. We can talk about data quality, but unless we can see it and manage it and track it over time. So some of these core artifacts, um, uh, they don't go away. <laughs> they, 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 again, maybe they're not in the hype top of the hype cycle, but they're part of business as usual, which is more important. Still really, really helpful. Where I have had a lot of success in our practice is do them, but do them in small bite sized chunk, kind of the, the agile version of, of data architecture, right? Pick a business problem and then do the data model around that or, or hone in on one business process. So, you know, this might be a, a hypothetical insurance company. You know, what data is going to support our customers or our brokers, or maybe we can get better data to price our policies better. And should we use external data or, you know, th then you can kind of build through the, maybe the customer journey map or the business process model around that, build the data model around that, show the data architecture diagram. Again, these can be so helpful, especially for people who aren't technical, um, you know, we can't do this because there's no line between system A and system B. You know, it, it just simplifies that in a way, or, or that line between system A and system B doesn't have the same data standard, so they can't talk or, or whatever, right? Simplifying the problem, um, et cetera. Do we have the right data quality to make that decision? So we'd love to use this credit information to price our policies, but half the credit scores are empty, or we don't trust the source of the credit scores or whatever, whatever, right? So uh, I'll, I'll show this in the case study, but I would say, please don't skip a data architecture. Um, if you're the type of company that wants to move fast, you know, break things and, and move ahead and do it more agile, um, just do it in a smaller way. Uh, don't do the, I would say, no matter what company you are, don't do the, we're gonna build a huge enterprise data model that's gonna take two years and then come up for air. You know, people have moved on by then, who even knows what's gonna happen two years from now, right? So build it in a way, either high level and broad um, or more detailed and targeted so you can really get some value quickly and then, then do it again, right? Rinse and repeat. So um, metadata is a big part of that. So I, I, well, when I rant about tools at the end, um, you don't always need a tool for everything. I mean, you can, data governance, your tool could be a Word document, right? Or an HTML page to say, this is the policy around PII. Um, 
But even better is when you can take those policies and make it an and condition, right? Then add the technical part, either the lineage, a lot of these data catalogs or a lot of the security tools can do automated lineage. AI and machine learning can detect a whole lot now that we used to do by hand in the old days that wasn't that long ago. <laughs> um, so again, things like metadata management or lineage really are super powerful. Um, and again, working together, right? You don't wanna have your audit trail or your lineage not tied with your core policies. Um, and again, seems to be a trend I've just noticed in the past maybe 18 months here of um, things like PII or security. A lot of tool companies now have the fancy tools and they, and they can do the lineage. And they can, but the question is, I don't understand what those rules are. What are the policies? How are we defining what PII really is? Some of the basic ones we know, you know, social insurance number, social security number, but how, you know, beyond that, is age PII, is it gender PII, you know, and, and so that's where the governance side of that happens. So this is a great example of you need the people side and the business needs of what PII is and all that nuance and the technical audit and lineage. And if you only had one of them, it wouldn't be very successful. You don't want people in the data governance committee, you know, setting a PII rule and walking around asking people, do you have PII? That would be one extreme. <laughs> you want to automate that. But the other extreme, you don't want to just automate all the PII detection, but not have a good definition of what PII or personally identifiable information is, right? So maybe that's obvious, but I thought it was a helpful example. Okay, here's my tool rant. So tools are great. I've built them, I use them, love them, um, but don't start with a tool. So one of my favorite stories, so a lot of my customers either start or become friends and we, we joke, um, but one guy, I'll name him, I'll name him Frank, just for an automated bit, uh, ran a big insurance company um, in North America and I met him at a conference and someone said, you should talk to Donna, she, she can help you with your data governance. And he said, so what, I want to buy this tool that we're on you. I'm like, what do you call him? Frank. Frank, you can't, don't start with the tool. Like you need to do everything else. You need to understand, do you have a data governance committee? No. Do you have roles? No. Do you have a, you know, charter? No. He said, well, get all that stuff in place before you go look at the tool. He's like, oh, but I, I saw that demo. It's really cool. I'm like, you know, Frank, stop. Let's, so we did. We did a whole data governance strategy. We did a whole data strategy. They ended up committees. They did actually everything right. And then at the end, he's like, can I buy that tool? I'm like, please don't. If you're just playing with me. Um, but one of the things we did as part of that is what, what tool do you need? Even though you need a tool, these tools can be so different. And data governance and data architecture have so much nuance to them that I hope you're maybe pick up on a few things you hadn't thought of, you know, from your kind of viewpoint. Um, is it some tools are really good at, you know, helping you create that data governance organization and the workflows? How do you validate a business definition? There could be workflows that go to the steward. Some are really good at that. Um, so here, you know, they did a kind of a matrix. What, what's, is there a business need? And then do we need a tool for it? So yes, it's a business need, but you know, just create the organization in this company, maybe I don't need a tool for that. It could be PowerPoint, you know, it could be a whiteboard. Um, or it could be we have such a complex organization, we need one of these tools that can help us with the workflow. Neither answer is right. You need to tell that, right? Or uh, logging issues, you could do raise your hand in a meeting. That would be one extreme. You could do a SharePoint workflow, or you could buy a big fancy data catalog, or you could use Jira, or you could, again, a lot of different things. Business glossary is a classic one. You might just want to start even with an Excel spreadsheet just to get, the, you know, and I often recommend folks to say, do do every kind of like when you were in math, when you were a kid and, and they'd make, I don't know how they teach it now, but <laughs> we have to do it all by hand before you use the cat calculator. We're like, why do we need to do this one of those calculators? Well, because you need to know what the calculator is doing. So I kind of, um, yes, math teacher, and when I was 10, you were right, right? So um, same thing with a glossary. A lot of the part of a glossary is getting those definitions, getting people together to agree. And in that process, do that first without a tool is what I'd say. And then you can say, you know, do we need a tool that helps us with the workflow? How do we need to publish it? Do we have hierarchies of glossaries? Do we need something fancy or can we do it with a SharePoint list? You don't know that answer until you've kind of maybe gone through it in a pilot or a trial. Uh, again, so, you know, one of the customers we work with did something like this so based on their, the importance of each functionality and who is using it. Another aspect of it, is it needed by the tech team or the business team? And then what features do you need? You know, a lot of companies buy a great tool, but it's a techie tool that they put in front of business people or something that the business really liked, but, they, you know, it's just not robust enough for the tech. To really give that some thought, tools can be super powerful, but there's so much on the market today and there's a lot of overlap. You know, do you need a 
glossary or could you do enough with your data modeling tool and publish the attribute definitions out for now right i mean and a lot of those tools are now every every tool has a catalog it seems now right? i was on a i was on an analyst briefing this morning and we kind of you know we're joking about the catalog of catalogs because you know each each vendor has his own catalog right so anyway my small rant about tools yes they're good please don't start there um and and again, the, the the tool that Frank wanted actually was completely not fit for their business use case. They ended up with a very technical lineage tool because PII was very important to them. And the one he was looking at was beautiful and it demoed well and it would have been great for a different use case, but it really wasn't what they needed. Um, and he was still disappointed because it looked nice, but it didn't do really what they needed it to do. Okay, so um, here's the case study and then we'll, I promise we'll wrap it up for questions and then, um, yeah, let you go in your merry way. Th this was a good example. I thought this was a it kind of puts a lot of the pieces together uh, that we had talked about with how governance and architecture can work together. So this was a major retail company growing rapidly. Uh, they're based in the US, sold a really high end product um, that was IoT enabled and they could kind of track customer usage and they were really growing rapidly um, and, and really and they had a very loyal customer base because these were high end products. You, maybe you bought four or five in your lifetime and you're friends bought them kind of thing. So they had a lot of good things going for them, but their data was a bit of a mess. They had had a couple things, both on the business side and the technical side. And unnamed company, love them, but <laughs> they'd be the first to admit this. They had two master data management systems for customer. You all see the irony in that single version of the truth. And we have two of them. We like it so much. Um, and even on the technical side, they had a big major outage that lost they could calculate the revenue they lost because a da uh, you know, data engineer, or business, you know, database administrator decided to change the length of the product code on an operational platform. Ah, that's that's technical data governance. Everyone should be cringing right now that you don't do that. And um, they lost a day and a half of sales because their systems were down. So they had it on both sides from the business and the tech, and they're trying to grow rapidly selling stuff. So how do you convince management that's growing rapidly to selling stuff? A terrible way to do that would be like, you know, we need to automate the data types for our product code. Probably wouldn't get it right. So you needed to kind of tell that story. So what we did is we did something very similar to this, different use case, but we picked one area. One of it was um, they were they were not able to track their customers for all. when they went into the showroom and looked at this product. Um, they said, what's your email? They said, go away at stupid.com because who wants the email from the sales rep? Um, and then when they actually bought the product and they wanted to have it delivered, had the wrong email and they had to call, you know, they did their best. They called the people and, and tried to explain it, but it looked really bad. So they picked one piece of the architecture, just email address, did a customer journey map, business process model, data architecture diagram, saw where the disconnect was between these, did data quality, saw that half the emails were wrong or missing, and then created some rules and policy around that. Really successful. Um, sales was part of it. Marketing was part of it. Um, and you may have heard me tell the story before, but it's just it was such an extreme example of how this working. We did it in a month and a half of, again, you can do a lot of these architecture diagrams in a small piece. The head of sales, sales, not usually your first person that wants to be governed, said, oh, I need to have my folks actually put in the right email address. I'll start incenting them on that because uh, I didn't realize how important it was to marketing and everything else. Huge, right? If we had just come in and told the head of sales to say, make your, make your folks put in the right email address, that wouldn't have worked. He had to see through an architecture diagram like these, how it flowed and how it affected things. And then the head of marketing, she was a spitfire, basically said, I never thought I'd be using the word data flow diagram, but no one, no one else explained to me why my marketing campaigns didn't work. It was, again, it was all email driven, but they didn't see how things fit together. So this was a good example. They, they stood up a little mini data governance council with all the right people in the room, picked one piece of data architecture, used all the good old fashioned tools and really made a business decision and then moved on to something else, some of the bigger challenges, but picked one thing so that light bulb went off. So ending with a happy story. Um, in summary, data governance is both, both business and technical. When they work together right, they have a lot of success, and it really does take that vision, the village, to you know, it's both process and workflow and tools and, and all of that that need to fit together to make that magic happen. But, but it can. Um, so as as Sh 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 <laughs> get that uh, questions together, um, just a, a shameless plug. Um, if you want to join us next month, it is all about data li literacy around data architecture. Another shameless plug, we do this for a living at Global Data Strategy. If you need help, come to us. We're happy to help. And now I will open up the questions from Shannon. 
Anna, thank you so much as always. So many great questions coming in. Um, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday Pacific time uh, with links to the slides and the recording and to past webinars as Donna mentioned. Uh, so diving in here, Donna, what are the realistic deliverables of, data, of a data architect in a data governance program? Um, I think some of the ones that we touched on, see if I can move my own slides, probably not. Um, I think some of this picture gives some of those. So I think data models are a big part of it. Um, data catalog, data dictionary, again, there's generally an overlap between a data architect and the business side, uh, data flow diagrams, um, you know, your, your overall data architecture diagram, um, data quality dashboards, maybe you, again, you, depending your level, if you're the only architect or you lead some architects, um, you know, sometimes there's a data quality analyst that does that, but I, I would start with some of the basics, your data architecture, high level data, uh, or, you know, system architecture diagram, business process model, um, if you can and kind of show those data, you, you may work with a business process analyst, but kind of show those data touch points and your good old fashioned data model is always a good one as well. I love it. So uh -huh. um, Gartner says in 2022, many data governance programs will fail due to the challenges faced in implementing it using traditional approaches. Can you tell us if this is true or what your opinion is on that? Well, um, I, Gartner likes to generate headlines with something like they're all going to fail. <laughs> so I, and then I would pull my um, definition hat on. What do you mean by a traditional approach, right? So um, having said that and been a bit snarky to pull Gartner, who I actually respect, um, I mean, I think, well, what do we mean by traditional approach? I mean, I think something we've found is that more kind of bi business-led collaborative approach, um, you know, yeah rather than let's just set a bunch of rules and policies and force people to do stuff and we don't know why. I think if that's what they mean by traditional, absolutely agree. I think it has to be a little more agile, a little more dynamic. Um, I, you know, a lot of the even data catalog tools are much more collaborative driven and letting people, you know, it is it maybe another thing they might mean by, I didn't read that article, I probably should have. Um, but, but traditional is like, and, and sometimes they still work. If you're talking about master data, you create the definition and the committee approves it and it is validated, it is vetted from the top down. Um, but if we're talking about measures and metrics, you know, maybe that needs a little more discussion and, and kind of, you know, collaborative uh, chatting and that, and that kind of thing. So I think there's a lot more tool. Some of the traditional approaches need to stay. Um, I think I have that in a previous webinar of like, depending on your data, again, master data, probably should be pretty traditional and structured. Uh, we're doing some data science and exploration. Maybe it is better to have a more collaborative approach to kind of coming up with metrics and definitions. So I think it's a bit of a mix, but yeah, you don't wanna to be too rigid um, with anything with governance. That's the, a great way to, to alienate people and have them feel like they're not part of the conversation. Perfect, and I'm gonna try and fit in as many questions as I can here. We've just got three minutes left. Um, what does a data governance program takes, or why does a data governance program take so much time to show value? Why um, value is not shown to consumers immediately or in the short term? Hmm. Um, good point. I mean, I, I, we're a big fan of, of trying to do it in, in quick ways. I mean, the reason it takes a long time is because there's a lot of big decisions that need to be made. Um, but back to that email address example, that was one that they came to a decision in a month and a half, and then were able to execute something pretty quick. Sometimes those things to change, right? And that now now make sure that all emails are right across the whole organization. That, that took some time, right? But what we try to do in the end, that magic sauce is, what is something, small thing you can pick that's going to show success? Um, Short, in the short term so that people can, can have the patience to do the things that take longer. You don't always have success like this, but we did one. We did a, a data address cleanup uh, right before a big campaign for a nonprofit. They tracked the addresses they had cleaned up and then they made, you know, not huge for another organization, but this was a smaller company. They were able to show $75,000 in additional donations based on those clean addresses, right? So that one was like in a month, they showed ROI. You don't always get something like that, but is there something like that where you can solve one problem and then show the ROI and build? So you, you can't wait because people are, they're busy, right? And they're going to go on to the next thing. So I would say, try to build your data governance with a bunch of small quick wins as you do those other ones that are going to take, some things just take a long time, but you have to show enough and keep marketing, marketing, marketing. So people understand the benefits. 
All right, Donna, and we could probably do a whole webinar on this next one, but we've got two minutes, so <laughs> <laughs> we need your elevator pitch. Um, <laughs> so even, even the best data cataloging metadata repository tools have major deficiencies in implementing data architecture artifacts, so I'm not sure how a data architect can, um, can be successful in this program. Uh, well, I say data catalog is not the only tool in the toolbox. So again, and I'll blame the vendors there. So now we have catalogs, you don't need anything else. I mean, you still need a, a data model. You still need a data architecture diagram. Um, I mean, we, we've often though taken something like a conceptual data model and put it as a, a link in, in the data catalog so that because a lot of business people like that, it shows not just the glossary definition, but how those things fit together. So, you know, uh, definitely own your own artifacts and there's a whole place for that, but some, some of those can be published and kind of highlighted in, in, the, in the data catalog, even if it's just a PDF picture, if, if, if that tool doesn't support it very well. Uh, and that's often a nice one that gets people's attention. Oh, you did it. I love it. Perfect uh, timing. <laughs> Donna, thank you so much. And thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. But I'm afraid that is all the time we have slotted for this webinar. Uh, again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. Thanks, everybody. Donna, thank you so much. Thank Hope you. Have a great day. Good luck, everyone. Bye-bye.